Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Distinguished Speaker webinar series on special and inclusive education organized by the School of Education at the University of Nicosia. My name is Christina Hajisotiriu, and I'm an Associate Professor in Intercultural Education. First of all, I would like to warmly thank our distinguished guest, Professor Donald Deschler, for accepting our invitation and being here with us today. At the same time, I would like to thank my colleagues at the School of Education for organizing this initiative. Donald Deschler is the Williamson Family Distinguished Professor Emeritus of Special Education and the founder and former director of the Center for Research on Learning at the University of Kansas. He began his work teaching in an Eskimo village in Alaska. His R&D has focused on firstly, the design and validation of interventions and technologies that enable struggling learners to meet state assessment standards, successfully graduate and succeed, succeed in post-secondary settings. Secondly, strategies for restructuring secondary schools to improve literacy attainment for all students. And thirdly, strategies for building capacity within school staffs that lead to sustainability of change initiatives. Professor Deschler has served on the board of directors and as the chairperson of the professional advisory board for the National Center for Learning Disabilities, the president of the division for learning disabilities, an advisor on adolescent achievement to several organizations, including the Carnegie Corporation of New York, the National Governors Association, the Alliance for Excellence Education, the Council on Families and Literacy, and the U.S. State Department. He is currently a fellow in the Whitley Institution at Brigham Young University. We now welcome Professor Deschler to present his intervention entitled Evidence-Based Interventions that Markedly Impact Academic Performance in Struggling Adolescent Learners. Professor Deschler, our digital floor is now yours. Christina, thank you so much. And to all of you who've uh, taken time to join uh, this afternoon, thank you so much. I'm just honored to have this opportunity. Uh, I just want to begin by building on that wonderful little video that we saw at the beginning. Um, I've had, since receiving this invitation, I've spent considerable time uh, learning about the university, about the school and the Department of Education. And I have been so impressed with the quality of the faculty, the currency of the offerings that are made available through the university. And what I was particularly struck by, because within our research center, we've done a considerable amount of research on the whole topic of online learning for students in school as well as at the university level. And I was particularly, uh, noted, I particularly noted that uh, your university has received a very rare, what's known as a 5QS um, star rating, which is the highest rating that a university can receive for the quality of its online offerings. So uh, I hope I, I live up to, to that expectation. But with that said, um, let, us, let us begin, as Christina shared the, the title of uh, what I'd like to address today, a little roadmap for how we might go. And I might just say one other thing. If you have questions along the way, please ask, and uh, I'm very happy to try to answer. So uh, here's the, some key areas I'd just like to touch briefly on who is the Center for Research on Learning or what have we done. The peak, first big topic is what are some important role of curriculum demands? Um, often we say if kids are struggling in learning, let's understand what's wrong with the child. What kind of learning problems do they have? Well, that's some important information to have. But understanding what are the demands of the curriculum that they must meet in their various classes, because that's where they're encountering failure. Thirdly, 
we're going to take a look at how we might change the learner so he or she might be more successful. And specifically, I'm going to share with you some of the research that we've done on in the area of learning strategies and some of the specific tools that we've designed and taught to students and how we teach them. Then, so in other words, the focus there is on changing the learner. Then the other side of the coin is changing our teaching. So if we have an academically diverse group of students with a lot of different learning needs, how might we teach them so that all of the students, the very brightest in the class, as well as those who are struggling, how they all might learn and benefit from what is happening. And then finally, I'm gonna end with a few other factors to consider by way of intervention. So let's get started with a little bit about our uh, Center for Research on Learning. That's it in the winter time, that's where we're housed. Just a few things about our center. We were founded in 1978, so we've been around for a while. Our mission to create solutions that dramatically, and I should underscore that word, dramatically improve learning and performance so that the quality of life is increased for those who experience barriers to success. We've completed about $215 plus million dollars of contracted research and development over the course of our existence as a center. We've designed about 150 products and technology supports. Why? Because as a center, yes, we do research, but our main goal is to come up with solutions that make a difference in the classroom for students. We're not interested in just publishing in academic journals that only a few people read. While those things are important, it's much more important since we're an applied field to make a difference in the lives of students. We're interested in getting what we do out to the out into the world. So we've set up an international professional development network that has about 3,800 experts in it that meet on the front lines with teachers and administrators to share the things that we've done. And during the course of this network's life, we've, we're, we've supported about 850,000 teachers in the work that they're doing. So that's a little bit about our center. But one other piece, you know, you hear a lot about research to practice. Yeah. We like to think of it in this terms, practice, in other words, go out into the field, find out what teachers are currently doing, much of which is good and is working. Let's learn from that. Then let's take it into the research that we do. And then after we perhaps refine it a bit or add to it or augment it, then we take it back out into practice. So we see that practice, if you will, is sort of the bookends of the work that we do and critical bookends. Here's a little model that we follow. Uh, looking at 12 o'clock on this at the very top, we try to identify what's going on in the classroom. What are the needs of the students? Then we explore some potential innovations and ways to uh, possibly ad address that. Sometimes it's necessary for us to apply for some funding to do our work. Then we develop the classroom innovation and conduct some studies, but we go back and continue to work with teachers. And often, since we're working with adolescents and young, young adults, we work with them as well and get their thoughts and their inputs in terms of the kind of interventions that would make a difference. And then we produce uh, over in the left about seven o'clock in our diagram here, we produce classroom materials and PD, that's professional development materials that can be used to help bring these innovations into classes. We prepare professional development leaders, conduct professional development, and then look at widespread adoption innovation. So that's sort of the cycle that we follow. So that's a little bit about and how we do our work, our little role that we might play in trying to, to make things better for students who struggle. So let's move to the topic of the important role of curriculum demands. Critical question. How do the demands of the curriculum change from grades five through 12? As students move out of those primary years, and the, you know, what, how does it change? You know, and I raise that question, particularly in light of the fact early on 
in grades, you know, uh, pre, uh, K through five, one through five, they're learning the basic skills, how to read, how to compute, and so forth. The assumption is when they move into grades five through 12, they've acquired those skills. Well, what if they haven't? Here are some of the, the demands of the curriculum we need to consider in the text as well as online because that's how learning comes. Here's a few things about traditional texts. We know, or assignments, if they're not in actual textbooks, uh, things that they're reading, the assignments become longer. The word complexity increases. The sentence complexity increases. The structural complexity of the passages increases. The graphic, rep graphic representations or visuals become much more important. Can they decode these? Can they make sense out of them? Can they connect the graphics and the visuals with what they're reading? The conceptual challenges increase. And text vary widely across disciplines. So those are things we know about traditional text as well as the abstractness increases. So these are some of the things that are facing students in traditional learning. What about online learning? Since so much students are getting through and online devices. Here's something, some studies that we've done looking at the text difficulty, first of all, in the upper left-hand corner, text difficulty across history lessons. Now, um, across the horizontal axis are lessons. So we, we looked at 30 different lessons. Up across the vertical axis is the grade level of reading difficulty. So you can see how variable that reading difficulty is across those history lessons. Looking at the lower one. Look at the variability of the difficulty of the reading passages across the course of 30 lessons. Likewise, in English language arts, how that varies. So the average reading level is the eighth grade, the average. So if you have a fifth grader, you know, you can see the average level is eighth grade. And in many cases, it's much higher going up to the 14th level in some cases. So that's a little bit that we've learned about online learning and that curriculum demand. One other thing for us to consider, and this is sort of from the teacher's perspective, and it's what we have called in our center the information explosion, instructional time dilemma. So if we depict time by this dark green box back in 1980, this is how much time teachers had to teach. And this is how much content they had to cover. And teachers back then, I mean, I was teaching at that time, uh, we were complaining, oh, we don't have enough time to cover all that we need to teach. So there's more content than there was time. So let's go up to the year 2000. Well, the instructional time didn't change that much. But boy, the amount of content and curriculum that we were expected to teach increased dramatically. Well, what about where we are today. Again, students are still attending school the same amount of time, but the content and the curriculum, the information explosion is just almost overwhelming. And it's a, a real challenge for teachers to figure out how do I navigate all of this content and make it meaningful and decipherable for students and students. How do they take all of this added information in? It's a real challenge and dilemma that we have today. So with all of that, why is understanding the demands of the curriculum important when we plan instruction for students who struggle in learning? Why is it? Let's take a look at that. Well, first of all, we need to, in light of those curriculum demands that we just looked at, consider some of the characteristics of students who struggle in learning. We know that they have difficulty often in concentrating, in navigating written information, organizing and remembering, expressing ideas verbally or in writing. And often students, uh, especially in, in Europe, um, speak multiple languages. 
And so there are those challenges that uh, are added upon. So thus, considering the curriculum demands and the learner characteristics of students, those two things that we need to consider as we approach it instructionally, what evidence-based practices should we consider or ones that really work? Because our time, remember that, those little green boxes? Our time is so limited. We need to make certain that we're using those instructional practices that yield the greatest outcomes for students. So to help us understand this and answer this question, I want to present this little graphic, we call it, in our research center, the performance gap. And it goes like this. If we look along the horizontal axis, and we consider that years in school. For each hash mark, it's a year in school. Along the vertical axis are the skills that students acquire as they go through school. So we look like this. At the end of one year, they pick up a year of skills. At the end of three years, they pick up three years of skill. Theoretically, that is that uh, red line there represents what we might call normal achievement for a student who is acquiring the skills as they progress in sort of a normal trajectory. But let's look at something else. Let's, if you'll notice up on the vertical axis, I just added the, the word demands. Remember we were talking about demands? So these red, this red line are the skills that students acquire. And now notice on top of that red line, I superimposed a yellow line. That yellow line indicates the demands that students need to face. They get more difficult as the, as the years go on. But if students are acquiring the skills, they're in step with the demands, and they're achieving. They're doing well. School's a positive experience for them. Well, what about students who go through school, and each year they don't quite pick up the skills that we would hope that they would pick up? Well a gap starts to develop. And our research tells us that about the fifth or sixth grade level, their acquisition of basic skills in reading and writing and mathematics and so forth, they tend to plateau. Well, what doesn't plateau? The demands of the curriculum. So that demand, that gap gets wider and wider as time goes on. And so the existing supports that are available in traditional schools, that's, it's just not enough to close the gap for them. So what we need to do is think about things we can do to change the learner. So there, they can pick up some strategies to close that gap. And that's the first thing we're going to talk about. But there's another piece of the puzzle, and it's, changing how we teach or how we present the curriculum in our classrooms. Can we make it more learner friendly? And we call this set of interventions content enhancement. In other words, we're going to enhance the key features of the content to make it more understandable for the learner. Okay, so we'll come to each of those in just a little bit. Let's start with learning strategies. That is, what are some things we can do to change the learner or empower the learner who is lacking those basic skills but is, finds himself in dealing, having to deal with curriculum demands that are often over his or her head? Well, I'm going to give you a little task here. I'm going to give you 30 seconds. And what we have here is a list of 15 words. And while we can't interact with one another, when I say go, I want you to pretend you're in cl class and you need to memorize these words, all of them. Okay, ready, go. Okay, we're going to stop. 
Uh, well, I can go back there and do this. Okay. So if we had a chance to carry on a little discussion, and I've done this with several groups over the years, and say, so how'd you do it? And <clears throat> they come up with a variety of ways. Well, I looked at the first letter, and I tried to re remember them that way and formed a little mnemonic. Or some saw that there was some fruit there, there were some cars there, and there were some animals there. So I put them into three categories. And that helped me learn. them. Well, if you did those kinds of things to this list, you were being a strategic learner. You saw sort of, if I said, just learn this list of 15, what on the surface seemed like random words, that's sort of an overwhelming task. Well, what we found in the research that we've done for students who struggle, we've given them similar tasks like this, and we find that they often don't look at ways that they can strategically approach it. Rather, they just sort of become overwhelmed by the task. So some guiding questions. What are some powerful strategies that you use to learn new information? So think about yourself as a learner, and you'll be amazed at how many strategies you indeed use. How did you learn these strategies? Well, chances are, if you were a normal achiever, high achiever going through school, maybe these weren't explicitly taught to you. Often they aren't taught in many of our classes. And But you picked them up naturally because you're an experimental learner and you just, in the course of learning, you did so. So the question is, why is it important for those students who don't automatically pick them up? Why is it important to teach learning strategies? What are some important strategies to teach? And how do we teach learners who struggle to use learning strategies? So those are three big questions I want us to try to answer. But I've been using the term strategies. What do I mean by that? This is how we define stra uh, strategies. It's an individual's approach to a task or an individual's approach to a task is called a strategy. And a strategy includes how a person thinks and acts when planning. For example, I asked you to learn that list of words. Well, you got that task, you stood back from it for a few seconds and you looked at it, you, you thought about it. You didn't just dive in and start at the top properly and try to memorize it. And after you got a little plan, you acted on it. Okay, so you, it's how you think about it, how you act, your planning, how you execute it. And then you figure out, oh, that didn't work if I'm trying to be learn, use just the first letters. Hmm, then you stand back and see, oh, there are three categories here. And so you're evaluating your performance on it. So that's what a, str a strategy is or strate strategic instruction is instruction in how to learn and how to perform. So we teach students some high, high, very powerful strategies to help them in the learning process. But once they get it inside, the other half of the coin is, can they demonstrate their competence? Can they explain what they've learned to their teachers and to others? Can they write it out? and so forth. Can they apply it in real life? So all of that is involved in strategy instruction. So to our first question, why it's so important to teach learning strategies? Well, let's look at this closet. I, our kids are all raised right now and they have their own kids. Uh, but when they were growing up, I remember opening their closet and it looked something like this. Now I go in and look at our grandkids' closets and they look something like this. Every parent or grandparent's dream is that they look like this, right? Everything's organized and put in its place. Well, oftentimes when we get inside the heads of kids who struggle in learning, information comes into their minds and they don't have ways to sort it and categorize it and put it onto different shelves and areas in the closet. Why? Because they've not been taught how to do it. 
And so that's what we want to do, how to categorize and use information in a wise way. So how do learning, uh, learning strategies assist struggling learners? Well, they help them focus their attention. They give a specific path for them to follow to complete tasks. It helps structure their learning and their practice so that they don't have to spend as much time in, in schooling. And for teens, that's a pretty cool thing. It makes learning easier for them. It improves their outcomes. And it teaches them to become more independent. And you know what I'm going to do for this one? I'm just going to skip over this so I can get down to something that I think is more important for uh, us to understand. And I know we have in our audience some teachers who teach real young children and others who teach young uh, adolescents and young adults. It's important where, wherever on the continuum we're teaching that we understand building blocks for content literacy. What do I mean by content literacy? That's the literacy that all of us ultimately need in life to achieve. After we, you know, move through school and we're, as we're moving through secondary schools, we are acquiring various content, science, history, uh, geography, and so forth. And then we move into real life, the content we learn on our jobs and so forth. Well, we're not going to be successful in learning that information, in learning about the world around us, unless we have in place key building blocks. At the foundation of it all is language, and hence all the emphasis for little kiddos, preschool, that we build up a language-rich environment and experiences for them. Because that lays the foundation for when they move into school and start reading, acquiring those basic skills, they have a solid language foundation upon which to build. Skills provide a solid foundation upon which to then build various learning strategies. So without those two other basic foundations, learning strategies becomes more challenging to acquire. Then with those things in place, then we can more readily acquire history and language arts and science and so forth. And then ultimately we can engage in higher order thinking. So the piece I'm going to be focusing on is this one in the middle and, and it's really a critical one to take us into the rest of life. So this is a, the author of this quote. <laughs> he was a longshoreman but he is a very sophisticated man, but he said this, in times of change, learners inherit the earth. And I think we'd all agree we live in a time of change. Things are happening so quickly. What is current today is not current tomorrow. So in times of change, learners inherit the earth, while the learned find themselves beautifully equipped to deal with a world that no longer exists. Eric Hoffer said that. The learned are those who just learn a set set of subject matter and then they think, I've got it. I don't need to learn anymore. Well, that's not the way life is. And so that's why we teach strategies to kids to have them become ongoing learners so they can deal with the changes that come to them in life. So that's our first question why we teach strategies to kids. It's to equip them to be successful, not only in school, but to navigate the changing world that they're all moving into. So what are some important strategies to teach? Well, in our center, we've developed what's known as the Strat Strategic Instruction Model, or SIM. And it's a comprehensive set of literacy, social skills, self-advocacy strategies and I'm going to go through and I'm going to give you a link. There'll be a handout that'll be available to you where you can go in and look at these in detail. But we're going to look at a few of them here. But understand this. For a strategy to be good, a good one, it must be powerful. It must be relatively easy to use. It must help students across many tasks. And 
we need to teach it to them explicitly and systematically. Okay, so there are some strategies we can come up with that are, are cute little strategies, but they aren't sufficiently powerful to cut across many subject areas. They may be very powerful, but if they're not relatively easy to use, kids won't use them. We've done a ton of research on that. We need to make it so it's palatable. And so they, when they see a task, they right away think about, oh, I'm going to use RAP or I'm going to use pirates on that. Those are some acronyms for strategies we teach to them. And so, and so we're going to dive into this. So within the SIM learning strategies, we have a set of strategies that help students acquire information or take it in. For example, some strategies to help them identify difficult words as they read some information to paraphrase it and put it in their own words, how to ask questions as they're reading through a passage, how to form images and to help them remember things better. So there's a host of strategies to help them acquire when they're reading, when they're listening and so forth. Then once they take the information in, we have some, uh, some strategies to help them remember it and to store it so they can use it later on when they need to express themselves, either in writing or in taking tests or completing assignments or whatever. So I'm going to just take one from each of these areas to demonstrate. So this is the paraphrasing strategy. So envision a student has a, a reading in history and he has several paragraphs to read. This is what we teach them. Step one. Read a paragraph. Break it down. Don't feel overwhelmed by how big the thing is. So read a paragraph. Step two, sort of push the pause button and ask yourself, what, were the main, what was the main idea and details in that paragraph? Okay? So you're sort of just reflecting quickly in your mind. Step three, put the main idea and details into your own words. So we're having man manipulate that information and make it a part of who they are. When they do these things <clears throat> of chunk chunking the material, so read just a paragraph or later on just read a small section, push the pause button and ask yourself some questions. What was the main idea? What were some key details? And then put it in your own words. When you do that, <clears throat> a lot changes. So I'm going to break this little simple strategy of RAP. That's how we teach it to kids. Remember to use RAP, okay? And they memorize that. And they memorize the steps so it's automatic. Here's what's involved in these steps metacognitively. The first letters spell the mnemonic RAP. And it's related, which is related to the behavior of going through and repeating and so forth. Secondly, the strategy steps are task specific. So they cut across many kinds of reading materials and not just to one, not just to English, not just to science, but they cut across a lot. Next, the student uses self instruction of the strategy steps to cue themselves what to do next. So initially, the teacher is with them, but they're cue we, they, we want them to use it independently. Additionally, there's only a few steps. It's not an overwhelming one. Hence, it's relatively simple to use, but these steps cue critical cognitive behaviors and processes for them to involve in. Each step of the strategy begins with a verb. No, read, ask, put. And that puts them into an active response. The word of the steps is simple and brief. The steps cue the reader to use cognitive strategy of self-questioning. And this step cues readers to relative to organize the what they've read from important to and unimportant and ferret those things out. Okay? So there's a host of things in this simple strategy that we've designed. Um, and you'll get these uh, these uh, PowerPoints if you want to study this more in detail. So that's an acquisition strategy. Let's take a look at a, a storage strategy. This is a first letter mnemonic one. And so if you have that list of words, like let's say you divided those list of 15 words into fruit, 
Uh, you saw that was one of your groupings. Now you have five fruit. How am I going to remember those? Sometimes, you know, we can form a word by looking at the first letters. We might insert a letter if it doesn't quite form one to help us form a word. Or we can rearrange the letters in some way. Or shape a sentence like every good boy does fine for the uh, notes in music or whatever. Try combination. So we teach students how to manipulate the information they have and configure it into ways that makes it easier for them to learn it. Let's look at a expression strategy. This is for students writing a the theme. Again, we give it a mnemonic. It's called Tower. But the steps that they go through are think about what am I going to say. They organize it. They write a draft. They evaluate it. And they refine it. But we give them a diagram to use to help them in this process. It's called the tower diagram for each of the uh, letters in that strategy. And this is one that has been filled out. So if they're asked to write an essay on baseball, um, they say, OK, what, what's my introduction? Well, I'm going to give a definition and some things about the, you know, their brainstorming. You know, two teams of nine players, it's played in warm weather, and so forth. And then you notice those little numbers next to it, one, two, three, four, after they've brainstormed, then they go back and they order it. And they also may say, oh, well, there's some options. Here's a, a song or whatever that they might want to put in. Those are just some options. And then they say, okay, how am I going to divide this up? Well, I'm going to talk about the people involved and the equipment they need, and the field that they play on. So they put those down, and then they're going to go back and say, well, I'm going to start with the field. Hence, they put number one over there. And then they gen uh, generate some specific ideas underneath it. And then how are they going to conclude? So we give them a structure within which to organize what they're doing. In other words, a strategic approach to deal with the demand that is placed upon them. There's a little air monitoring strategy. This is one other for students to go back after they've written something. And it's called COPS. First of all, reread each sentence and say, have I capitalized everything? What does the overall appearance look like? Especially if they're using handwriting. Can you see everything? Did I use the correct punctuation? And what about spelling? So we teach them, hey, we give them a prompt. Be sure before you turn your paper in to apply COPS to it. And so this is an easy to remember, but a very powerful strategy that will dramatically change the overall look of what they do. So then the last question is, how do we teach struggling learners to use learning strategies? Well, it's this little formula we need to keep in mind. A learning strategy, a powerful learning strategy, plus effort equals success. Oh, and we tell this to, to students, hey, we're struggling right now. We're not being successful on the right side of the, the formula here. I've got a really neat, powerful strategy that I can teach you. You want to learn it. We need to get their buy-in. And then we say, hey, I'm going to do my best to teach this powerful strategy to you. What you need to do is bring everything that you've got to the table with your effort. We put those two together, and you're going to be successful. So how do we explicitly and systematically teach strategies to kids? One, we give them rationales, especially for teenagers. They've, they've bummed out. They've not been succeeding. If we're going to try to get them engaged and teach them this strategy, we need to give them some powerful rationales why to do it. Then we name the strategy. This is a paraphrasing strategy. It's going to help you, you know, better comprehend what's going on. Then we model it for them. We just don't tell them. We go through and go through a passage. We talk out loud, sort of show them their, our thinking. What's going on in our mind as we read this passage? How are we applying rap to it? Then we make it a part of the big show. I mean, <clears throat> as we're teaching in class, this is not just a little sideshow. This is something that is important for all of us to learn. It's going to make us all better learners. And 
um, and then we have them do it and we place value on it. So if we place value on it, hey, if they do it, we reinforce them or we give them credit on a paper, an assignment or whatever, if we have evidence that they've used the strategy. And notice, we need to do these things many times. It's not a one-shot thing. So in short, if we want students to become strategic learners, we must differentiate between an activity, just doing something cute, one-shot kind of thing, and <clears throat> between a strategy that we really teach seriously. Lauren Resnick at the University of Pittsburgh in our country spoke about teaching on the diagonal. And for content teachers, one who teaches math or history or science, she says there are two things we need to be concerned about. On the left axis is the content knowledge that students acquire. On the right, or the horizontal axis, are their habits of thinking, their strategies for approaching that content. And she said where we should spend our time as teachers is teaching on the diagonal. It's a combination of those two things. And so teachers in what I call strategy-rich classes understand the illiteracy demands of their text. They provide guidance to students on how to process text before, during, and after. So they're pushing the pause button and saying, what should we be doing here? How should we be thinking about this? in a strategic way. So we make this a part of the conversation. We provide multiple teacher models of how to process a discipline-specific text. And we focus classroom text talk on how to make sense of text. So we're not just teaching the content, but we're teaching how to process, make sense of, and learn the content. OK? So we talked before about there being two kinds of change, learning strategies that we've just talked about. It's focus on changing learning in the learner. Now we're going to shift very briefly to content enhancement. Here we're talking about changing the teaching that we do. I'm going to take you back to this graphic of the performance graph. Remember I talked about changing the learner. Those strategies, our purpose of that is to increase or change the trajectory of this line and move it much closer to where all other or normal achievers are performing. Now we're going to switch to this side of the equation. What are some things we can do if I'm a science teacher or history teacher? What can I do with my content? So that's where we're going to go and look at some things about content enhancement instruction. Well, what is that? <clears throat> well, it's barrier-free instruction. We have to stand back, again, looking at these demands of the curriculum and say, wow, where is it abstract? How might I make it more concrete? Where is the organization in this that's going to take kids off the rails and they're not going to clearly follow the law, you know, a, a clear line of logic here. Wow, I got to do away with that barrier. Or, hey, at this point, they should be asking questions. Maybe I should interject a question. That's going to clarify things for them and knock down some barriers. So we're looking at ways to do that. So content enhancement instruction is based on these principles. We want both group and individual needs to be valued and met. When I talk about the group, we want, if we're teaching 25 students in our classroom, we want all of them to increase in their knowledge of what we're teaching them. Not just the high achievers and not just the high and the average achievers, but we want them all to increase. So we need to think about the diversity of our classroom. We need to, however, keep the integrity of the content intact. We can't compromise the key things that we're teaching them. Next, we need to understand that there are critical features of the content that need to be selected and transformed or changed in a way that promotes student learning. 
And I'll give you an example, two examples of that, so you better understand what I'm saying there. And then finally, instruction needs to be carried out in a partnership with students, that is, between the teachers and the students. In other words, we want the students very actively engaged in the learning and teaching process. It's not just the teacher standing at the front of the room and giving the information to students. There, the teacher is active, students are passive. We want to have the students very actively engaged in this process. Our data tells us time and time and time again that makes a huge difference in learning. So let me give you two examples of content enhancement. Or I might end up giving you three. Let's see. Uh, <clears throat> so this is what we call a unit organizer. And we encourage teachers to use this at the beginning of every unit that they're teaching in school to help kids get the bigger picture. Now, um, what I'm going to do is take one of these and I'm going to fill it up with content. I apologize that this content is United States specific, but hopefully you'll get a sense of what's going on here. I'm going to fill it out. This is about the civil war that took place in our country in the mid 1800s. And so let, this is now filled out. We don't give it to students filled out. We fill it out together with them. And we say, here's a, a graphic. This is going to help us organize all the things we're going to be covering during this unit. So let's see what we've got here. First of all, we organize the big chunks of content we're going to be covering over the next couple of weeks. You know, and you can see we have four chunks of content we're going to be covering with the students. We spell that out for them. We tell them how the knowledge is going to be structured. You know, we're going to be describing a lot of things, but we're also going to be comparing and contrasting. This was a war between the northern states and the southern states. So we're going to be comparing and contrasting. And we're going to be looking at cause and effect. Certain things happened that caused other things to occur. Now, why that language? That's learning language, and we want to interject that so they see how those terms are going to become, come to life. We give them some guiding questions. You know, here are some big questions that all of us want to be able to answer in a deep way at the end of studying the unit. So we give them the questions up front, okay? And these aren't yes, no question, questions. These are ones that cause thinking. Okay, and I, I just got, might go back. And so there's, there's, there's some other parts of that, that graphic that I could go over, but I'm not going to because of time limitation. Here's another one. Now, it's related to the previous one. You'll notice up there the current use, unit was about the causes of the Civil War. Well, huh, we're assuming that students know what a Civil War is. Well, do they? That's a concept. Well, if we don't have that clear in their mind, when we go through this whole unit on the Civil War, <laughs> they're going to be wondering in their mind, what is the Civil War? So what we do, since that's a critical concept, we're going to teach that to them separately and in depth. So we take Civil War here. Well, here's some things. We, we ask them questions. Hey, I'm a, we're going to talk about Civil War. What do you know about it? And we get some information. What do the students know? Just ask them a question. So we list their information may be up on the whiteboard or chalkboard, whatever you have. Then we show them that this information is, we can categorize. We're going to be talking about civil war. Well, there's a lot of kinds of wars. And they fall into a bucket or a cookie jar, I often say to kids, that we called armed conflict. Civil war is one kind of armed conflict. A world war is something else, is armed conflict. Those are two cookies in the armed conflict cookie jar so that they can see this is a specific one we're bringing out. Then we analyze the characteristics. And with every concept, there are three kinds of characteristics. There are ones that are always present, sometimes present, never present. For example, in a civil war, it always involves a group of citizens. It's within a single nation. It's about distribution of power. Whereas some, sometimes civil wars are for religious reasons or ethnic reasons or political reasons, but not always, hence the wavy line. And then at the bottom, we give them some examples of civil wars, 
non-civil war or non-examples of civil wars. And then we give them a test. We put something in the testing ground. And then finally at the bottom, we define it. And there's a, a set of steps that we go through to, to do that, which I've just gone through. Let me show you one other example as I conclude. And we've all familiar with the, a Zen diagram. And so if we're doing a Zen diagram to see the difference between mammals and fish, this is what it would look like. We've enhanced that graphic by coming up with a, a comparison table. And here we're back to the Civil War, but we, it's a Venn diagram, but it helps to be, make things clear. We list the characteristics separately. Okay. Those are the linking steps. Then we come up with some categories for characteristics. And so it's, you can see at the top in the ovals, the economic conditions in the north, the economic conditions in the south, and the characteristics of each. And then the box under that, the like characteristics, the students separate out. And the two boxes under that, the unlike characteristics. And then we have them put them into quality, into categories, because it helps them to define it easier. And the instructional methodology for that is we cue the students about the device. We then engage them and do it. Hey, we're going to be learning a unit here to help us understand the the um, what we're going to be covering, we're going to use the organize the unit organizer. So we give them a cue of it, and we hold it up. And after they you've done it several times, they're used to it. The do part is to filling it up together, asking them questions and filling it up. And then review part once it's filled up, boy, we spend a lot of time working with the information, having discussion groups and writing little paragraphs and so forth, and that helps them review it. I'm going to conclude with this. There's a host of other factors. I've talked about two academic ones. There's some non-academic ones. It's important also that we teach students how to be their own advocates, to teach them to nurture student motivation and not just assume that they'll be motivated, to work as a member of a team, to have social interactions, and so forth. So there's a that's a whole other thing that we could go through, but... Because we're limited on time, I'm going to conclude there. And uh, Christina, I'm going to turn it back to you. And uh, for any questions that we might have. Okay. Thank you very much for uh, that thought provoking presentation. It was very interesting to follow all of this multidimensional approach um, that you have discussed about. It is important uh, to change, as you said, not only the curriculum, but also the learner and our teaching approaches. And it's also important to take uh, into consideration all the non-academic factors that also apply. We have a number of uh, questions. Uh, we have uh, participants from various places of the world, as far as uh, the Caribbean, that from Cyprus is quite far away. <laughs> so uh, I have noted down the questions uh, in the chat room, and uh, we can uh, begin when you're ready uh, with the first uh, one. Okay. So uh, the first question was, if we can relate uh, learning strategies to learning how to learn and thinking how to think theories. You can, can we correlate those? Yes. Okay. Uh, yes, I think there's, um, uh, you know, a host of strategies or theories that have driven the work that we have done going back to the early work on uh, cognitive behavioral modification and so forth has been foundational to, to uh, what we have done. Um, and uh, then, of course, we've been really influenced by the work of, uh, that's been done in uh, uh, behavioral analysis, uh, you know, the explicit ways in which we teach strategies to students. It is structured um, in which we uh, systematically break down tasks and then build one set of learning upon another 
and a scaffolded and structured approach um, to help in the learning. We find uh, that uh, it, instructional theories that promote discovery learning initially, uh, that is more implicit kinds of learning uh, theories versus more explicit for struggling learners, our data tells us initially that uh, discovery learning often is not the most productive. Our time is so limited in trying to build these strategies in that they've not automatically acquired that we often don't have time to go through the discovery approach. Plus, we find it is not as productive for students. So we become we're more explicit initially. Hence, it's more teacher dependent. However, over time, it's critical that we shift to the other end of the continuum where we become more um, student driven rather than teacher driven because they ultimately need to own the strategy. So uh, if I may also ask a question, uh, starting from the point uh, that you have ended, do you think that we can teach strategies to students for critical inquiry before just uh, the situations that you have mentioned? In, 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 by the ones I've mentioned, I've referred multiple times to being in a history class or a science class. And so your is your question before they come to those grades where the curriculum demands? Oh, absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Oh, yes. We... We should be talking about how this whole process of how to learn as early as students are learning. I, I mean, we have some small grandchildren and I'm on the floor playing with them and as they're putting some mm -hmm. Legos together or whatever, and they've chosen to do something quite creative and, and really constructing this neat thing. I'll say, wow, let's stand back to explain why you did that. That's real. I never would have thought of that. I really love the way you thought that through and did it. Or he's building something with Legos and he puts the final piece in and the whole thing falls apart. Well, our one little grandchild, it doesn't phase him in the least. He just goes back to work doing it. I don't allow that to just happen. I say, Loic, before we go on, the way you're, you know, it fell apart. You picked it up and you started going again. That is what good learners and good performers do. They deal with setbacks, they get up and they keep going. So there's a lot of things we can do early on to set the stage for things like this later on. And you have just replied uh, to the next question. The question was, have you tried these strategies with younger struggling learners? Are they as effective as with adolescent struggling learners? You have replied to that. It's very yes. interesting. I, I might just add this, however. Uh, <clears throat> there are some of the strategies that we have developed and used like uh, for students in grades uh, 9 through 12. And they really work well. And then what we do is we start working backward with it. And we say, well, can we take it down to grade six and seven? And, and then we keep pushing the envelope and pushing the limits. And pretty soon you get down to a place where the weightiness of the strategy, the, the you know, what students need to do with it becomes too, too much. It's too complicated for them. So we need to keep the strategy in alignment with where they are developmentally and uh, with the curriculum demands that they are facing. You know, they're not as rigorous, so we need to, to align the strategy with it. Hence, you know, we using uh, songs or rhymes and those kinds of things. Po they're powerful. Rhyming and songs, they are powerful memory and learning devices. But we see we use them with small children, right? And very can be very effective. So we can draw upon creativity and creative yeah. methods to teach the strategies. And Absolutely. this is very important for us as educators also. Yeah. And I just might add to that. 
as I said very early on in my presentation, when we're initially designing strategies, we start by going in and observing great teachers. Okay. Because we learn some marvelous lessons from teachers who are already successful. And we see some strategies that are, are being used. And then we'll sit down and talk with them afterwards. And, and in the course of that conversation, we learn some things that they'd even like to do to maybe enhance it a bit. And so that's some of the work we do. But then we also sit down early on with students and we say, hey, you know, you have to do these kinds of things in science. We're coming up with a strategy and it's going to be like this. What do you think of it? Would, would you use something like that? Or how would you make it better? We get great things from students that have really shed some rich light on what we're doing. So, If I may ask, uh, what happens with struggling teachers? Because we talked about struggling learners, but can we really teach teachers how to teach the strategies to the struggling learners and to the learners in general? Well, that's a good question. I think as teachers, we all struggle uh, in, in some way or another. Uh, teaching, as we know, is perhaps the most complex undertaking on the planet um, to, to really do it well. And uh, I know myself, even with some of the strategies that I've got today, on the surface, they may seem simple, right? Rap, very simple. But I have found it took me multiple iterations of teaching that to students until I did it well, until I was satisfied with how they were learning. it. And frankly, as a learner myself, there are some strengths that I have that I have called upon, some strategies that I have used as a learner that I've called upon that have informed my work. However, there are some weaknesses in me as a learner Okay, and that I've had to rely upon some colleagues like this tower diagram. My colleague, Gene Shoemaker, came up with that. We've written a lot of things together. But wow, has she taught me a lot about the writing process because she's so much better at it than I am. So we're all struggling in a way. But yes, we can all learn strategies. And when, we're, when the door gets open, to viewing the world from a strategic approach. The, being able to learn all that exciting information out there in the world becomes so much easier. That's what a strategy does for it. It helps us navigate life in a better way and so we can enjoy life more. So we need to paint that big picture, give even to us as adults a rationale for learning. It's such a hopeful message, though, and we can always call on our communities of learning and practice, even if we are learners or teachers or academics or researchers. So thank you for this wonderful message and uh, this positive way of thinking about education. Let's move to the following question. Do struggle adolescents feel that learning these techniques are an additional work to the curriculum? Do they feel more tired of it or are they positive to learn from your research? Wow, great question. Wonderful question. And you know, the first uh, consideration we need to keep in mind is uh, where is the head and the heart of the student? Um, many of these kids have tra traveled paths that none of us have the repeated failure that some of them have encountered, the discouragement, the negative self-talk that is, has gone on and that dominates their thinking and so forth. We need to be very sensitive and respectful of that. And I said head and heart. Uh, because, because that's learning, I've often said, learning is first and foremost an emotional, visceral, affective experience before it's a cognitive one. Learning strategies are cognitive in nature, okay? And so they bring all this visceral, emotional stuff as baggage with them, and we need to be sensitive to that. 
Hence, the first step in how to teach a strategy is giving them some good rationales and hooking them and making them excited about it. So we learn about what things are they excited about. Like we have a grandson is a sophomore in high school, and he struggles mightily with learning. He loves cars. Well, when I'm talking to Dre about some learning strategies, it's all in the context of stuff that he wants to read about cars. So we need to, to embed the learning within things that connect to them and their interests. We need to be sensitive to their history of failure. Hence, we need to scaffold our tasks very carefully so that we build in success along the way. Okay, so when we're teaching strategies, if it's a 10th grader and they're reading at the fifth grade level, we initially start for them learning the strategy and materials closer to their instructional level, that is the fifth grade level, so that they're not burdened with that 10th grade reading material, but they're in a fifth grade material so that they can then put their attention on learning the strategy. To your question about time, do they feel, oh my word, I got all the history to learn and science to learn, now I got this strategy to learn. That's a brilliant question and one that we need to address in a straight on manner in school. This learning the strategy and learning it well does take time. And we have found that when a science teacher has all of that content, science content to teach, oftentimes to, to teach a strategy and give students the amount of practice they need to become fluent with it, it's beyond what we should expect of that science teacher to do. Hence, uh, in, the, in the States, we have what's known as resource teachers, where a student will go with a teacher trained with some special education and do some intensive instruction on the strategy, like during a, a separate period or an in the place of an elective class. So that then um, they're not uh, having something added to them, but we try to fit it into the curriculum that way. It's very interesting to hear all of these things because it is very important, particularly for teachers, about educators across all the levels of education to acknowledge all of these issues. And also time comes up as a major constraint in most of our research uh, with regards to change. So yeah. usually teachers cite time constraints and quite often students and learners feel uh, yeah. Yeah. quite yeah. difficult with uh, time. It is, Christina, you are so right on that. And, uh, <clears throat> And some very difficult, hard decisions need to be made about how do we build time into a, the school schedule, into a stu struggling learner's curriculum schedule to have them learn these strategies. If It does take time. It does take explicit practice for them to learn a strategy to a fluent level. Hence, where's that time going to come from? If, if we don't find a place in the curriculum for it, let's just face the reality, the kid's going to go through and face life not being able to learn, okay? It's, that's just the reality. We can only kick the can down the street so far. So what do we do? We have to find a, a way to take some time out of elective classes or to build in uh, some resource classes where a student can go and get this explicit instruction. Then when they go back to the science history class, we teach that teacher, hey, Here's the strategy he learned, prompt him to use it. Just go up and say, remember to use wrap. Okay, that's the role they play. So we need to find ingenious ways to do it. But if we don't, we're going to have students who don't know how to learn it. It's going to be a road of failure and they're going to drop out. Here in our School of Education at the University of Nicosia, we have introduced a particular module on academic literacy. And that was about teaching strategies to our students to cope uh, with uh, their academic responsibilities. But indeed, in Cyprus, uh, as possibly in the States, as we explained, we don't have a specific curriculum space for teaching strategies at uh, primary and secondary education. So uh, this suggestion is very important also for policy interventions uh, in the field of education. 
Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What I just spoke about is a policy issue and, and it, it requires some very difficult trade-offs and so forth, but we need to do that. Now, with that said, okay, the ideal would be where students can, can have some kind of configuration where they can be taught on a smaller student teacher ratio and taught the strategies explicitly and intensively. Okay. And it can happen quite quickly if you have those kinds of configurations, given that you can't, and that's not possible. As an interim, what can happen, I'm going to take you back to that slide I had on uh, strategy rich classrooms. What does a teacher do in a strategy rich classroom? Think of the history class, the science class, the English language arts class, okay, or whatever. You build a strategy in, okay, and you say, okay, we all need to read this chapter, but we're going to read the chapter in a, the way smart learners do it, okay? We're going to learn this strategy rap, okay? And all learners, high achievers, average, low achievers, can benefit from it. It's just going to take longer to teach it. And you, you, but you, you build it in just a little bit at a time, okay, where you're not taking too much time away from the content. You build it in and you say, hey, in the course this year, as, at my, as a, in my science class, I'm going to teach them one strategy. I'm going to teach them rap. That's it. Well, you reinforce that throughout the course of all the science teaching you do. You are going to create some changed learners over time. And if you plan with your colleagues and in another classroom, that teacher says, I'm going to teach cops. I'm going to teach the kids how to monitor what they write. I'm not going to teach anything else uh, strategy wise. I'm going to teach that. And if some other teacher chooses another strategy, okay, you're going to change collectively the learners and do it within the existing structure of the school. Now, on the content enhancement routines, you know, the graphic, graphical organizers, those are designed to be used in science classes and history classes for all the students. So uh, do you think that it is also important to be explicit, I mean, for teachers to be explicit about which routines and which strategies they use to students because quite often uh, we see teachers who use strategies, but the learners cannot really acknowledge what oh. kind of strategies the teachers use. If I could answer that question with a, in bold face, all capitals, yes. Yes, make the students aware of it. Absolutely, don't do it in a hidden way. We want to make it very explicit and talk about it, say, listen, the best learners in the world, best learners are strategic learners, okay? They figure out ways to navigate and get through information in a, an efficient way, okay? So it doesn't take a lot of their energy and an effective way so they can learn stuff, okay? now. I want you guys to be efficient learners and effective learners. So I'm going to teach you some powerful learning strategies. As a class, we're going to learn these. And we're going to learn how to sort and, and categorize information. And we're going to learn it together. And the whole reason we're learning this is because there are so many cool, exciting things in the world to know about and to learn about. And I want to give you the tools to do that. So in our science class this year, there are two things we're gonna learn. We're gonna learn how to, uh, we're gonna learn critical content about science. And secondly, we're gonna learn how to better learn science, okay? And if, if, if we paint that picture to kids and we infuse that in our minds and that becomes a part of who we are as teachers, we're going to change, bring about some positive changes. I think you made all of us to share your passion and we're very excited and we are very willing to go and try all these strategies in our classrooms across all the levels of education. We have one more question. 
Mm -hmm. Are uh, there any technology-based applications of content enhancement routines? Oh, <clears throat> yes. As a matter of fact, we've we've uh, put a lot of those in in a techno uh, t uh, computerized format. Yes, and um, yes, it, because that's and um, so yeah, we have many of our materials are in that format. And to that point, Christina, I've shared with you um, that you can make available to those who've listened today uh, a short two or three page handout that summarizes some of the key points that I've tried to make. And at the bottom of that are some resources, some websites people can go to to get some additional information on this. Um, and I'm comfortable if you share my email uh, with members of the class, if they have particular questions to write to me, I'd be happy to respond. Thank you so much for this honor. And uh, uh, if anyone of you is interested uh, in uh, communicating with Professor Deschler, then we can forward uh, to you the email address. This has been a very interesting, thought-provoking, uh, enlightening presentation. I'm very honored that I had this opportunity uh, to discuss with you today. I don't know if you have any final comments to the audience. They are all applaud and they all say thank you as I can read in the comments. <laughs> Well, again, it, it's just been my honor to, to share this time with you. I know, as you said, time is our, one of our biggest enemies. We don't have enough of it. So giving me an hour and 15 minutes of your time, I'm honored with that. Secondly, I just knowing that so many uh, with us today are teachers or in some way involved in the teaching profession. I just say based on my 50 some years in the profession, uh, everything that you do to change the life of a student is is going to make such a difference down the road. We often don't see it. We are seed planters, and we don't see the the fruit that is sometimes produced from the seeds that we plant. But I would just encourage everyone to not lose sight of that fact and the profound impact they can have in the lives of students. This is a very important. There is a Chinese proverb saying that instead of cursing the darkness, it's better to light a candle. So let's all light at least one candle. If we can light multiple candles, uh, then let's do it. Thank you for your hopeful message. Uh, thank you all for being here. I will share my screen to let you know about uh, the following uh, seminars uh, that we have. And um, this uh, series, uh, the Distinguished Speaker Webinar Series on Special uh, and Inclusive Education has started in September 2021, is going to be uh, concluded in uh, June 2022. Uh, you can find additional information on the website uh, that is written here, www.unique.ac.cy, a do series. 2021-2022, uh, as you see it on the screen. So on the 11th of uh, November, we have Professor Sharon Vaughan from the University of Texas at Austin. Then uh, the following uh, webinar is with Professor Gavin Reid, uh, who is an independent ed educational uh, psychologist on the 26th of January in 2022. And uh, in February, on the 10th of uh, the month, uh, we have uh, Professor uh, Robert Horner from the University of Oregon. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, uh, Professor Deschler, for all these enlightening ideas and for your time and for the honor to have you, even though you are very, very far away from Cyprus. <laughs> Hopefully we can have the honor to have you here at the premises of the university. Thank you so much. I'd love that. Take care. Bye-bye.
good afternoon to